Uh, during the next three Sundays, Lord willing, uh, we would like to uh, bring messages that have to do with the first coming of the Lord Jesus to the earth. Uh, we uh, find that it's a, it's, it would be, it's a good time uh, for us to familiarize ourselves with all the scriptures surrounding the coming of the Lord to the earth, the birth of Jesus, uh, all the miraculous uh, aspects uh, surrounding the, the birth and, and God's preservation, the ministry of the angels, and all these things. And as you know, throughout the year, we don't talk too much about the birth of Jesus. And so even though you know, the world takes this in, into another dimension, which we don't want to go, uh, yet we want to stay with the, uh, the record. We want to know what happened uh, in, in the coming of the Lord uh, and uh, how God uh, just moved and ministered in, in some very special ways to cause Jesus to come forth and to come on the scene. This morning, would you please turn with me to Luke chapter 2 and verses 7 to 11. Luke chapter 2. Two, everybody turn there, please, and verses 7 to 11. And uh, this, of course, has to do with Mary the Virgin, who had been visited by the Lord uh, in an earlier chapter here in chapter 1, actually visited by an angel. And so it was, uh, this is verse 6, and so it was that while they were there, that is in Bethlehem, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in that same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord." I believe that the story of the birth of Christ will have more meaning for us if we consider the backdrop that uh, existed uh, for many centuries prior to the coming of the Lord Jesus. What was the condition that was on hand when Jesus was born? Uh, what had taken place on the earth? for a long, long time prior to the birth of Jesus. And I, want, I feel to cover that this morning, to just review that with you, to give you what I call is a backdrop against which the story of Jesus comes. Uh, first of all, let us remember again the situation and what happened with our first parents, Adam and Eve. We know that God... Uh, uh, had a tremendous calling for Adam and Eve. Uh, in short, they were, to, uh, uh, they were to manifest the image and likeness of our Lord Jesus. God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. That was God's desire, that there would be uh, uh, a vehicle on the face of the earth, a uh, uh, a, some kind of being that would manifest and ex give expression to all that God was. And so you hear the heart of God. God said, let's make man in our image and after our likeness. And that's what he did. And secondly, he said, and let them have dominion. And he gave them this charge that they would have dominion over the works of God's hands. And so we find here, folks, that Adam and Eve were the first kingdom people. They were a governmental people. They were called 
to have part in the government of God. Let them have dominion, he said, over the works of my hands. And so here's a high and glorious calling that uh, is uh, given to us right in the beginning. And uh, it wasn't long after that, how long we do, we do not exactly know, but uh, uh, there's the appearance of the serpent in the Garden of Eden. And uh, he comes along with the, the temptation. God had put them under command. He said, of every tree in the garden you may eat, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you may not eat of it. And so he gave them a command, implying that uh, your, uh, your commission, your charge to have dominion and to be a kingdom people will de be dependent upon your relationship to me, a relationship of obedience. Folks, God's plan always depends on obedience. If there's not obedience, God's plan cannot move forward. God's purpose cannot be fulfilled. Everywhere down through history, it always depended on obedience. And so we find that, that Adam and Eve uh, uh, were challenged along the line of obedience. Will they obey? He says, you can, tree, you can eat of every tree, but of the tree of, of, of good and evil, you may not eat. And Satan comes along and he always challenges God's word. He says, has God said that you may not eat of this, of this tree? Look at it. The fruit is good. And uh, uh, we find that Satan always uh, uh, tempts you through some kind of allurement, enticement. Look how good it is. And if you eat of this tree, you're not going to die. You're going to be as God. You're going to be wise. And so in all of that, trying to make this short, we find that a terrible thing was introduced into the picture. It's what we call sin. Sin is disobedience to God's commands. Sin is disobedience. And the terrible thing that sin does, it breaks your relationship with God. And when your relationship with God is broken, then there's another domino effect. God's purpose for our lives cannot stand. So you have those three things. Sin is disobedience to God's commands. And once that happens, our relationship with God is broken. And that's what Satan wanted to do is to break the relationship because he knew that if man was not going to be obedient, God would not go ahead with his purpose. And Satan, you see, wanted, Satan wanted the dominion. He wanted the rulership of this world. He didn't want man to have it or anybody else to have it. And so that's why he came along and introduced this thing called sin. And, uh, and so sin was introduced in that uh, temptation in the garden. And uh, we find that there were terrible consequences to sin, such as in the day that you sin, you're going to die. And also a curse came upon all the earth because of sin. Did you know that the earth is, sin, is cursed with the sin? Or is, is cursed uh, because of sin? There's a curse on the earth. And uh, we find also that sin is hereditary. In the next window here in the Bible, we see, uh, uh, we see Abel and Cain, the two sons of Adam and Eve. And they were worshipers. They wanted to get back into the garden of God. They wanted to become accepted of God. And Abel brought a good sacrifice. He slew an animal. And God saw that. And uh, that pleased his heart because it, it went ahead and showed the coming of the Lord Jesus and his death on the cross. Cain, however, used his own energy and his own strength, and he brought an offering from the field. And uh, the Bible says that God accepted Abel's offering, but he rejected Cain's offering. 
because it spoke of human strength and human endeavor. So you see, folks, what God is uh, pleased with. He's pleased with a sin offering of, of, of the shedding of blood. And Jesus is that offering for us. Jesus became that offering for us when he shed his blood. And Cain's offering was not accepted. But here's an interesting thing. God gave Cain a chance. And he said, and Cain was disappointed. Uh, and he was, in fact, more than disappointed. He was angry and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, why art thou angry? And why is thy countenance fall, fallen? If you do well, shall not thou be accepted? And if thou doest not well, if thou doest not well, sin lies at the door. And unto thee shall be its desire, and thou shalt, or it shall rule over you. And so here's what we see. We see that Cain was given a chance either to go God's way and to bring an acceptable offering, or if he persisted in going his own way, he said, sin lies at the door, and sin will take you over. And, in, and imagine, Cain remained angry and would not go God's way, and so, indeed, sin took him over. So I want, to, I want you to see the entering in of sin to God's, into God's creation. Adam and Eve had this high calling, but sin came in. And then uh, in the, uh, uh, in the uh, uh, formation of a family and the coming of the children, we find that sin is there. Sin is hereditary. And this tendency to go against God's way and to live in sin uh, it was promoted there in, in this scene. And so we see that sin entered into the picture. Sin became the problem. And so God, with all of his intention and desire to have man to be an expression of himself, was disappointed, to say the least. And the purpose that man would help him to establish a righteous kingdom on the earth, it was also disappointing because that was not possible. So there were two things that were not possible because of sin. The image of God was no longer possible. It was marred. And man having dominion and helping God to establish a kingdom was not possible because of sin. Sin is a terrible thing, folks. Sin ruins people's lives. Sin prevents us from fulfilling that high and lofty purpose that God has called us to. Becoming a kingdom people. Expressing the life of Christ. Ruling and reigning with Christ in his kingdom. So that's the condition that came upon the earth. Sin came in and ruled and reigned over in the picture of God's creation. And Cain felt uh, this uh, awesome, awful, I should say, impact on his life. Uh, God said, what have you done after he slew Abel? He slew his brother Abel in his anger. And the Lord said unto Canaan, where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And God said, what have you done? Look at that. Sin immediately, when, when it's taken to its ultimate it brings in violence, and it brings in murder. He killed his brother. 
Sin kills. Sin destroys life. Abel was slain in, 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 in sin's anger. When God said, Cain, if you do well, you'll be accepted. If not, you'll come under the grips of sin. And I want you to see what humanity is like and what humanity will become when it's in the grips of sin. Humanity will become separated from God and, and separate from His love. They'll no longer be a peaceful creation. Humanity will, not, will, not, will no longer be love, loving and kind and gentle and peaceful and comforting and all those attributes that God has. But people in the grips of sin will become violent and fierce and will kill. What have you done, Cain? The voice of your brother's blood cries unto me from the ground. And God said, listen, and sin carries with it an awful judgment from God. And now thou art cursed from the earth. You're cursed from the earth, which has opened her mouth to receive your brother's blood. When you till the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. There's a curse in the earth because of sin. And man is wrestling with this curse so that the ground does not yield what it could yield. We have to use all kinds of, and, and George knows it's getting worse and worse, we have to use all kinds of powerful fertilizers for the earth to bring forth, and even that does not bring forth what we see pictured here. God had meant for the earth to bring forth bountifully. But look what sin has done. Sin brought a curse in the earth. And earlier he had said to Adam, he said, you're going to, uh, uh, let me just read it. He said, uh, uh, because thou hast eaten under the, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of the, thy wife and hast eaten the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. And so man today continues to make a living and existence out of the sweat of his brow. Why? Because sin has brought a curse upon the earth, upon the trees of the field, and also upon man himself. And listen to what else he said to Cain. He said, when you till the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. There's a restlessness in man. There's no peace. Man turns this way and that way, searches this and that and the other. Some of the richest men on the earth go around the whole face of the earth looking for peace. They think they'll, they'll find some situation that will give them an, a peace on the inside. And all their wealth and all their money is not able to give them peace and put them at rest. Money won't do it. It's a one of the most deceiving things, and yet here we have a drive after money, after wealth in, in the face of the earth. That's interesting. You'll be a, a wanderer, a fugitive, a vagabond. And Cain said, uh, this is more than what I can bear, and God put a mark upon Cain, lest any man should kill him. But then there's an awfully sad verse which says, And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. He went out from the presence of the Lord. Sin will drive anyone out from the presence of the Lord. The original scenario was the Garden of Eden where God dwelt and man living in that presence and having all of God's blessings surrounding him. But sin drove him out into another dimension. 
which would be totally different from that. God's presence would not be there. God's blessing would not be in the earth. There would be a curse and the evidence of the curse everywhere. And man would would be grieved and would actually live a life of sorrow. And we find here that, and the Bible shows this, we find here that the generations of of Cain are listed. The, The genealogy of Cain is listed here. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch, and Enoch bare somebody else, and on and on and on and on it went. Until finally, the last person in the genealogy of of Cain is Lamech, and here's what it says. And Lamech said unto his wives, Ada and Zilhah, Hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Hearken to my speech, for I have slain a man because he wounded me, and a young man for bruising me. Here's a man that's crying out after having committed a heinous crime, as it were. And he's saying, oh, wives, hear me as to what I have done. I have slain two people. One because he hurt me, the other one because he bruised me. So I want you to see here that the the generations of Cain ended up in violence. Sin produces violence. You let, you let sin run its course and it produces violence, murder in every generation. And it goes on and on and on and on here. And then in, in chapter 5 of Genesis, and just bear with me this morning as we get going here, there's another Lamech that is listed in the genealogy of Seth. Here's what it says. And Lamech lived 182 years and begat a son. And he called his name Noah, which means rest. He called his name Noah, saying, This one shall comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. This is Genesis 5.29. So what I want you to see here is that man is, is, is heavily burdened under these conditions. Sin, is, as I said, has, has brought this terrible curse into the ground. And man is working under great duress to make an existence. And man is living in a hope that somebody will come along to deliver from the curse of sin. And so Lamech names his son Noah, hoping that that there will come rest from all this toil and deliverance from the curse. So that's the beginning of our backdrop. A scenario where sin has taken over. And the Bible takes the time for us to read this. In the next scenario is what kept on taking place after these days, which led up to the days of Noah. And uh, in the days of Noah, which uh, would be, uh, let's just to give you a little historical uh, uh, data here, uh, in, in Noah's day would be about 2500 B.C. If... Uh, if the birth of Adam would be counted as 4,000 B.C., which most scholars accept, this would be now 1,500 years later. 1,500 years later. What has developed on the face of the earth in 1,500 years? We gave you a picture a few hundred years after Cain that, that mankind was grieving. They were in in a state of agony because of the curse. Sin was taking its toll on the existence of humankind. 
in the days of Noah, 1,500 years later. Let us read. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. Genesis 6 and 5. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. I want you to see the conditions. We're creating a backdrop. And the Lord said, listen, listen how, how deeply this affected God. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created. That's the terrible effect that this sinful condition had on God himself. And the earth also was corrupt before God. And the earth was filled with violence. I'll tell you what, we have the same thing going on today. The earth is filled with violence because of sin. Sin leads to violence. Disobeying God's, God's command, uh, living a life to ourselves, independent of God, defying God's claims upon our lives, it ultimately will lead to some form of violence. Paul wrote to Timothy and he said, men shall, be, shall become fierce. Fierce. Incontinent. That means without self-control. And the earth was corrupt and the earth was filled with violence and God looked upon the earth and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted its way upon the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come, come before me, for the earth is filled with violence, and behold, I will destroy them with all the earth. And only Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives, eight souls would be saved at this point in time. What a terrible consequence. And we believe in the flood. We believe that it rained 40 days and 40 nights. Once in a while when it rains all day and all night, I think about it. Oh my God, if this would go on for 40 days and 40 nights, what would we have? The Schuylkill River starts to rise after two days. What would we have? You can see how the flood came on hand. And so here are the effects of sin. Sin is ruling. Sin is making mankind fierce, incontinent, killing one another. They're under this terrible condition of trying to exist with the curse, fighting man's very, uh, very existence. And so we have this condition existing at the time of Noah. Then God raises up. God seems to start over. God, you know, he never stops starting over. Uh, thank God for that. He starts over and he raises up a man by the name of Abraham and makes a covenant with him. And he says, through you and your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. And suddenly there's a ray of hope comes on the horizon because a message comes that says there's going to come a blessing to all the nations of the earth. And God raised up Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and through them there developed a nation called Israel. Israel grew and multiplied, and God had God was moving to restore this awesome purpose. Remember the purpose. The purpose was always to have an expression of God in the earth through humankind. That mankind would be restored in the image of Christ. 
and that also that man would have dominion, that man would rule and reign and have a kingdom of righteousness on the face of the earth. And so God worked with Israel. And we could date Abraham probably around 1,500 years before Christ. 1,500 years before Christ. There comes this, there comes this promise. There comes this announcement into the earth. Remember, this comes not only to Abraham, but it's coming into the earth. It's God, God's going to have a people that will bless the nations of the earth. A seed. We know that was referring to Christ. However, God was going to deal with a people, Israel, and raise them up first to uh, manifest something uh, in type and shadow. And so God labored with these people. And uh, uh, after the days of the patriarchs, we see the nation had, de had developed and uh, they were delivered from Egypt's bondage and brought out into the wilderness. And here again, in the wilderness, as we studied uh, the past 15 Wednesday nights, as we studied, we saw that these people had a tough time obeying the commandments of the Lord. They were a disobedient people. They could not hearken. Whatever was said, if it was, had to do with the manna, they had a complaint about it. If it had to do with their leadership, they had a complaint about it. If it had to do with, with whatever was on hand, if it had to do with taking the land of Canaan, they said, we can't do it. And on and on it was. They became a disobedient and an unbelieving people. So that we have sin entering in again. Sin entering in again. And though, though you had times when Israel rose up, there were good kings and uh, deliverers such as Gideon, Samuel, and all of that, David and Solomon came along and brought them to a high place, but they soon fell from that. And here's what I want to say this morning, beloved, that ultimately the, the, uh, the verdict that must be written about Israel as a whole, those, all those 1,500 years from Abraham down to Christ, here is what you would have to conclude. Listen to me. It's in Isaiah chapter, chapter 1. I'll read it for you. The vision of Isaiah the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, jo uh, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. Now, here's God taking us all the way back to their birth. I have raised up children. I brought them through the wilderness. I tested them on many occasions. They have rebelled against me. Hear this lament of the Lord, beloved. He says, the ox knows his owner. And the ass is master's scrib, but Israel does not know, my people do not consider. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel to anger. They are gone away backward. This is the ultimate verdict of Israel. That with all God's loving care, the many times he rose up good men, apostles, uh, deliverers, 
good people such as Samuel, Samson, uh, Gideon, uh, Deborah, all these people, Joshua, that, that were raised up to raise up Israel and to be delivered from this awful plague of sin, yet they failed as a nation. The ultimate verdict was that they were a sinful nation loaded with iniquity. So what am I trying to say today? I want you to see that from the time that Adam fell right down to the coming of Jesus, you have, to, for all intents and purposes, you have the rule of this thing called sin in the earth. For 4,000 years, you have the rule of sin in the earth. <laughs> but praise God. Praise God. In that scenario, and to that kind of earth, hallelujah, God makes an invasion. God sends his son. Because, listen, with all of that, with all of that sinfulness on the part of every generation, God still loved the world. Amen? God so loved the world. It's like you and I as parents, we hold on to our children. Even in the times when they're going their own way, they're, they're rebellious, they won't listen. God so loved the world in all of his sin that he sent his only begotten son. Hallelujah. And here's the message. There were angels in the field. I'm sorry, shepherds in the field. And lo, an angel came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone upon them. And they were sore afraid, and the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be not only for Israel, but for all people. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad for this message? Tidings of great joy, which shall be for all people, for unto you. And I receive this afresh today. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Unto you is born this day a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Hallelujah. And let us reflect this morning on his mission. What will this Savior do? After Joseph became betrothed to Mary, and she, he found her with child, here's what we find. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, that is, uh, to have her stoned. She could have been stoned. He was minded to put her away privately. And while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I want to sound that forth today. The main purpose of Jesus' coming is to deliver us from sin. Amen? The name Jesus means Jehovah is salvation. So God sent Jesus to bring about a change from this awful predicament that had existed for 4,000 years. Hallelujah. Thou shalt not be, be afraid to take Mary as a wife. She shall bring forth a son, and you will call him. God told Joseph what to call him. Thou shalt call him Jesus, which means 
Jehovah is salvation, for he shall save his people from their sins. Hallelujah. God sent Jesus to deal with his awful predicament called sin. And then I want you to see how that, you know what, I, I believe, uh, here's what it says. Let me just read a little bit further here in Luke. Um, uh, the angels uh, came to the shepherds with a message, and uh, uh, it says, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God. Praising God. We can praise God today because the Savior has come to our lives. Not only was the earth in that condition of sin for all those years, but there was a time when you and I were bound by sin. And God sent to us a Savior to deliver us from sin. A heavenly host praising God. Glory to God, and saying, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let us now go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. I wonder if they knew what all it meant. I wonder if the shepherds knew what it meant. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. They gave the message. The shepherds gave the message. And what was the message? The message was that unto us is born a Savior. Hallelujah. Now, I believe that there were those on hand at that time that when they heard the message that a Savior had come, I believe there were those that were saying, oh, at last, we're going to get rid of the Romans. Because Israel, they were slaves. They knew their history. A thousand years earlier, they were the dominant people. They, under David and Solomon, they became a kingdom which ruled the whole earth. Now they were slaves. The thing had been reversed. The Roman Empire was now dominating the earth. And they were hurting under the Romans. And I believe there were some who were more, more concerned about the matter of the Romans ruling than they were about sin ruling. And they misunderstood the message. I wonder if the shepherds fully knew the message. They were filled with joy, and they told others. And Mary kept, but Mary, now let's see here, uh, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning the child, and all they that heard it, listen to this, and all they that heard it wondered at these things which were told them by the shepherds. So this was spread around the, that community, and they all wondered, what is this? A Savior is born in Bethlehem. A king is born. What does this mean? And as I said, I believe some of them took the wrong meaning. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for the things that they had heard and seen, and as it was told unto them. Hallelujah. But I believe there were a few that understood. 
And when Jesus was eight years of age, Mary and Joseph brought him to the temple to be dedicated. And here's what we find. Let me read it. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. I believe here's a man that was concerned about sin. He was concerned about this terrible condition that had set in on God's people over all the many centuries. He was waiting, waiting for a reversal, waiting for God to do something about this disobedience, this unbelief, this terrible condition that had come in. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death until he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, they then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou, servant, depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Hallelujah. Simeon saw the salvation of the Lord. And the salvation of the Lord, folks, is not the overthrow of the Romans. It's not you and I having a better life. It's not you and I just uh, uh, partaking of the blessings of the earth. Salvation is the dealing with sin in our lives. That's the salvation. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And while this was going on, and Simeon went on to prophesy, I won't get into that now, but while this was going on, uh, there was a widow about four, four score and in four years, 84 years of age, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she coming in at that instance gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake, to all them, she spake to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. Now here, this thing is going out, spreading. And I do believe that Anna had the proper perspective on things. She looked for redemption. She wasn't looking for the overthrow of the Romans necessarily. She was looking for an overthrow of this grip of sin in the land, this disobedience, this awful condition. And she spake of him to all that looked for redemption in Israel. And finally, my last scripture this morning is this. This shows us the message that God wants to give in view of the terrible conditions of our day as John the Baptist was baptizing, Jesus comes to the waters of baptism. And Jesus, or rather John, was asked, Why baptizest thou then? If thou be not the Christ, nor Elias, neither the prophet. And John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you which you know not. He it is who, coming after me, is preferred before me, whose shoes latch it I am not worthy to unloose. And these things were done in Bethabara, beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day John seeth Jesus, coming unto him, and, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Praise the Lord. Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Look at what he was trying to, the message he was trying to give to them. This people who had, were sacrificing lambs over many years, sacrificing animals, 
for the forgiveness of sins. And now he says, look, here's the Lamb of God, which will take away your sin. Are you thankful for Jesus today? Praise the Lord. He makes a difference. It is only he that can make a difference. He is the Savior. He is the only one that can save us from sin. He is the only one that can save anyone from a life of sin, a life of slavery, a life of violence, a life of debauchery, a life of, of great deviation from the purposes of God. Praise the Lord. I hope that and trust, folks, that in this season of Christmas,